morning, church, and welcome to Alive Fellowship Church. We're in our series that I have called A Marriage to Cheer For, and we've been looking at many, many things. And let me just give you a little review. You can go online to watch all of them in great detail. And so, because football season is just starting out, I kind of took a football approach to all of this, and we talked about words and terms from football and how they might relate to our marriage. Uh, we talked about how we have to have a game plan. We must play for the team of we, not the team of me. Uh, we talked about what we can do offensively, and that means we surrender our will for the success of the team. We make serving our lifestyle, and we're very unselfish. And then we also spent some time talking about our defense, how we can defend our eyes, defend our uh, our thought lives, our motives, our mouth, and we should be transparent. And then last week, we talked about being loyal, uh, how we have to have loyalty and commitment, and they are simply commodities that are slipping away in our culture. And we really talked about how we are to be loyal to Christ first, that He is the rock, the foundation, and we are to be loyal to our spouse, our kids, other believers, the church, and then obviously loyal to our careers also. Now this week, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to look at something different. Uh, this week, as we talked about a marriage to cheer for, I want to talk about our families in relationship to us as married couples. And I've entitled this uh, having uh, the family being a team. Now, what and how do we manage our marriages when children are in the picture? Now, we all want to have great kids, but not at the expense of everything else because that's not success. So what I want to do today is I want to give you some sim simple principles that will cause you to succeed in this area of the kids being a part of the home. And so let's get started. And the first one is this. We must have a united front. Uh, when kids are involved. Uh, Mark chapter 3 says this, a kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. And we talked about that last week. But I, but I want to talk about this. It says in verse 25, similarly, similarly uh, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Unity in the family is essential. Not only unity with our spouse, like we talked about last week, but we also have to have unity within the whole of our family. Uh, and as husband and wives, we must always present a united front to our children. We cannot allow our children to divide us. Kind of like the old, I'm going to go to dad and ask him if I can do this. He says no. And so I'm going to secretly go to mom. Uh, type of situation. We are to be united on everything. And if we're not, then we don't move. We talk, we think, we pray, but we have a united front uh, when it comes in relationship to our kids. We must be consistent in our parenting, our, our discipline, what we reward them with and, and train. Otherwise, we're pitting ourselves against each other. We must have a united front. Never allow a significant difference to develop in how you express love to your kids. Otherwise, they're just going to go to you uh, or how we uh, discipline our kids. Uh, uh, one should not always be in charge of the discipline. And here is what I have learned. Our children need both of us to be affectionate to them, and they need both of us to help in the discipline area. Their physical and emotional development is directly tied to the affectionate attention that they get both from mom and dad. Now, this concept and this idea that kids will always just be okay uh, without both parents, man, it's just not supported. <coughs> Top three. So this concept of kids being just always okay without both loving parents is just not supported. Yes, you have amazing kids that come from a single parent home, and you also have kids that come uh, from a home with both parents that have all kinds of issues, so that we know it can go both ways. But let me share with you some, some thoughts and some ideas and some figures about when dad is not present. And I know it could also go the other way, but, but what happens to kids if, if, if the father is not present. Now, according to the research, they have found these narratives to be uh, true. 
The results of fathers uh, of, a, of a father absence on children uh, are really uh, nothing short of disastrous, right? So here's some things they came up with. Children's diminished self-concept and compromised physical and emotional security. And so they just didn't feel secure and, and they felt like they were being abandoned if the father was not involved in their lives. And that makes sense. They also discovered many more behavioral problems. Fatherless children have more difficulties adjusting socially. They're more likely to report problems with uh, friends and behavioral problems, how they develop intimidating personalities, and all of those have underlying fears of resentment and anxieties and unhappiness. And did you know truancy and poor, poor academic is traced to dad not being in the home? Get this, 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. Fatherless children have more trouble academically scoring poorly on tests of reading and mathematics and thinking skills. Children from, uh, from a father who is absent in the home are more likely to be truant from school, more likely to be uh, excluded from school, more likely to leave school by the age of 16. And whether it's delinquency or youth crime, including violent crimes, did you know that 85% of the youth that are in prison had an absent father. And it goes into the young girl's promiscuity and teen pregnancy. Fatherless children are more likely to experience problems, including a greater likelihood of having intercourse before the age of 16. Becoming a teenage parent uh, and con uh, contracting sexually transmitted diseases goes off the charts when a father is not in the scene. And girls who experience rejection from their fathers are more likely to be exploited by men. Drug and alcohol abuse just soar off the charts. Fatherless children are more likely to smoke and, and drink alcohol in excess and abuse drugs. And, it, and it, it is just a very, very sad, sad picture. Homelessness, 90% of runaway children had an absent Father, can you imagine that? And there was a recent study reported that preschoolers, preschoolers, not living with both of their biological parents are 40 times more likely to be abused. So whether it's physical problems, health problems, future relationships, it is a, it is a dismal picture when mom and dad are not in the picture. We have to have a united front. Our kids' lives are, are always at stake. We need to make sure we always honor each other in front of our kids. You always make your children honor your uh, spouse. And unity means what you do to her, you did to me. So we must have a united front. And then number two, uh, we have the greatest impact on the formation of our children's lives. Mom and dad, when we have a united front, we have the greatest impact on their life. The truth is, we produce, uh, we reproduce what we are, not what we want, right? And let that sink in for a moment. 1 Corinthians 4 says, For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you only have one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ when Jesus, uh, Christ, Jesus, when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. This is the Apostle Paul here talking. So our children's view of, of race and finances and uh, our roles in marriage, communication, uh, conflict resolution, prayer, church, God, uh, diet, eating habits, respect, love, forgiveness in the Bible, all of those, all of those and so many others, all of those in many ways will hinge on your involvement in your children's lives. <clears throat> a lot of times I had people would say when I was a youth pastor, I need you to fix my kid. That's a lot of pressure on a youth pastor. Now, I'm sure parents think they are doing the best job that they can, and in many cases that is certainly true. Now, I am sure parents think that everything they're doing is for the benefit of their kids, but it is so vital that they see us united so that, that, so that it will have the greatest impact on the formation of their lives. How we pray and love and resolve differences 
How can your children succeed unless they see you succeed? Your life speaks louder than your lips. Uh, do you want your children to be just like you? And here's the key here. <clears throat> the key is the way you're living your life, empowering them for success, or the way you're living life, is it confusing them? As a married couple, we have a united front, and we need to realize we have the greatest impact on the formation of our children's lives. And then number three, raising, we got to remember that raising children is temporary. It's temporary, and we got to put them in the best place for success. Uh, too many parents hang on too long and do too much for their kids. You see, if we forsake our marriage for our children, it's going to send us into despair when our kids leave home. It also makes us overly dependent in-laws. Now, you make your children overly dependent on you. It will, cre it will create resentment in your spouse. So our goal is to build and create independence, not codependence. Now, isn't it true that when your kids move out or they get married, you want them to succeed, right? I mean, we all want that. And as our kids, as Karen and I's kids got older and became teens, we began to add and treat them like adults and kind of like every year or as they were maturing, we would give them more and more responsibilities. It was a, it was a growing process, right? I uh, recently watched this report <coughs> where a girl was given so much uh, from her parents that, and they never taught her how to deal with kind of real life. And so this young girl, it's a true story, this young girl uh, turns 18 and she kind of wants to move out of the house. And her parents agree to give her, now get this, $5,000 a month. And so they start doing this. Well, somewhere along the lines, mom and dad finally get smart, right? We're not going to keep doing that. She doesn't want to work. She doesn't want to do anything. We're not going to continue to do this, right? And so somewhere along the, ro the road, they get smart and they stop and they tell her basically, you go get a job. You start doing your thing. So, so she sues them and the court ordered the parents to continue to pay her $5,000 a month. And because they chose to have the kid and they had set a precedence. Now, what a spoiled, spoiled kid. My dad would have given me a loaf of bread as he opened the front door. That's just what have happened at my house. But think, we say that she's spoiled, but who caused this? And uh, who is now reaping what they sowed? Look, by their senior year, we want our kids functioning independently from us. That doesn't mean we don't watch out for them and take care of things and help for things that might come up, but it does mean that we're just not writing a check for everything that they want. We need to always be in the formation business. Whether it's as simple as going to bed or school or homework, going to work, having a job, uh, doing uh, some laundry, managing finances, whatever. Uh, and here is the big picture. To see our children, this is what we want, to see our children become fully functioning, self-controlled, self-disciplined adults who serve Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we want, right? That they can manage their time, their relationships, their finances with excellence, without influence or aid or assistance. Principles to help you succeed uh, in the family dynamic. Have a united front. Uh, the greatest impact that you're going to have is the formation of your children and realize that it's just te uh, temporary. And let me just speak to this. Parenting takes faith, Proverbs 22, uh, 6. Direct your children on the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Training does not mean just talking. Training means showing. And you must have faith that if you do the right thing in front of them, that will return in how they will do the right thing. And our children will make choices and decisions that are 100% in defiance against our will and our hopes and our desires. We all know that to be true. They're not going to do everything that we want. And so let me speak to this. What happens when kids make bad choices? When they just make bad choices, how do we deal with that? I think there's a beautiful story in the Bible. And let's work through uh, this real quick. So when kids make bad choices, because we know that is going to happen. So in Luke 15, you see this, this story that I'm sure many of you have heard. It says this in verse 11, to illustrate the point further, 
Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. So the young son says, hey, I want what's coming to me. Father says, okay, here's the half that I, uh, that I was going to leave you. The other half goes to your other son. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all the money in wild living. Now, what are some thoughts that come from this story? I think one of them is we have to recognize that you cannot override your children's will. <clears throat> one of the most difficult things in life that I've ever had to uh, do is to watch my kids put the pedal to the metal and drive over a cliff in a bad decision. <clears throat> Several years ago, my son buy a tr bought a truck and he paid it off. It's a brand new truck, paid it off. He had no payment on this thing. It barely has 20,000 miles, and he wanted to trade it in for a sports car. And I'm sitting here going, Ryan, you have that truck. It's paid off. It has no mileage on it. Keep it. If you want a sports car, that's fine. Go do that. But no, he traded it in. It was just a bad decision. And as parents, we have to recognize that we cannot override our child's uh, will. And also, we have to allow them to make mistakes. We, we have a tendency to want to rescue them from going into the ditch, but, but listen, the ditch may make an impact that lasts a lifetime for them. So, so whether it's allowing the natural consequences to happen or whatever, when we intervene in hopes of saving them, we many times will only delay the inevitable. Go back to our story. Uh, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. And so now the son who took all of his money and he blew it, he's now in a bad situation. Now I always wonder, did the father know about this, right? Did the father know about this and did he, did he choose not to just go and, and save him or what was he doing? So the son who began to starve, he, per, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even what the basically what the pigs were eating is something that he wanted. <coughs> Excuse me, what a big mistake, right? And sometimes we have to allow that to happen. Uh, and then next, don't blame yourself uh, or each other. All children go through challenging times and trials. You're not a bad parent because your children made a bad choice. In our story, was the father a good parent? I think so. He provided well for his family, had enough to give to his kids. He, he let the boy go. He gave him what was, was his, and he, and he let him go. And then we know at the end of the story, he welcomed him back. So I would say he was a good parent. Was God a good parent uh, uh, when Adam and Eve uh, sinned? Well, sure, when they disobeyed, he's still a good parent. Don't play the we could have or should have. The enemy will use the sins of our children to divide your marriage, whether it's through guilt or condemnation, fear, uh, telling you that you're not good enough. Also, we have to love them unconditionally. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love never fails. Now, many of us are very good at loving conditionally. I will love you if you do what I say. We need to be a safety net. Uh, as they walk this tightrope of life, uh, the net is our love for them. Love them unconditionally. It will eventually get through to them. And they must feel that there is a safe place to talk. And listen very carefully. If, that, if there is not a safe place to talk, then they are not going to share with you things. I, I call this, you always want to be in the place of influence in your kids' lives. When your kids stop calling you and talking to you and asking you for advice in some big areas of, of, of life, that is concerning. They want a place not to be judged or be yelled at. Uh, parents, we need to discuss things calm, uh, calmly. Don't try to change them, just love them. They want to be understood. We must always accept them. That does not mean we approve of everything they do. And then another thing, mom and dad, and what we're supposed to do is we are to envelope them in prayer. Your prayers make a difference. James 5, 16. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Every day you lift them up in prayer, asking God to help them make good decisions, keep them safe. Well, one of the things that Karen and I did when our kids were, were small 
uh, is we began to pray for their future spouses. I mean, we didn't know it at the time when they're four, five, and six years old, but we were praying for Laura's husband, Luke, and we were praying for Lindsay's uh, husband, Braulio. And we're praying for, for the day that Ryan would find the person that God has uh, uh, for him. right? So every day we lifted them up. You can't override their will. Uh, you have to allow them to make mistakes. Don't blame yourself for the mistakes they make. Love them unconditionally. Pray for them. And then it's important that we stand on the promises of God. Proverbs 22, 6, train a child in the way they should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Isaiah 55. And then Isaiah 55, it is the same with my word. I will send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Ephesians 6, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Mom, Dad, we're not fighting against our kids. There is a bigger war going on. What is that war? It's against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in a dark world and evil spirits that are coming against our kids. That's what we need to be fighting, not them. Stand your ground. Don't be moved by what you see in the natural. When I think about our story, go back to our story, it says, when he finally came to his senses, he said at home, everything the hired servants have, food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you, both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. And so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. What was the father thinking? What was in his mind while the son's gone all this time? I think of things like, I wish he was home. How was he doing? I pray that he's safe. I don't know, but what I do know is that the father, with the reception that he gave his son, was, was nothing short of amazing. He kept expecting and believing. Uh, make sure that your kids know that no mistake is unforgivable. Uh, when kids feel hopeless, uh, it drives them deeper into the sin and the bondage. We offer unconditional love. And it says in Luke 15, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. It's just amazing. And he tells his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him, get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf. We have been fattening. We celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now is returned home. And he was offering unconditional forgiveness. And so he was lost, but now he's found. And I always think of Ephesians 4, instead be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And I love the fact that the father restored him into his rightful place. Provide the resources and, ass and assistance to restore them fully. You see, let me close with this. When he came to his senses, he got up and went to his father. And his father was so filled with love and compassion for him that he ran to his son. He didn't wait. Ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. What a beautiful picture of how we are to be there for our kids. We don't do everything for them. We put them on the railroad tracks of success. And every now and then when they jump off those tracks, we have to help them get back on the tracks. But it's so vital in how we treat our kids and how we mature them. Mom and dad, we have to keep a united front. And we have to do those, those hard things, the disciplining and the loving and all of those things to keep the family unit going, and that will help us to have a God-honoring marriage. And it will help us to have a marriage to cheer for and a family to cheer for. So we be loyal, and we are loyal to our spouse, even in the midst of our families. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for today. I thank you for our time to be able to, to look at, Father, how we navigate this thing uh, called marriage with, with our kids. Father, help us to, to love them and pray for them. 
and help us to keep things in order uh, that you would want us to do. Father, we tell you that we love you and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Hope that you'll tune in next week as we continue to look at a marriage to cheer for. God bless you all. Have a great week.